Good day class. As promised in the previous part of this lecture, let us now look at the formulas and concepts for speed, velocity, and also for acceleration. In some cases, during the travel of a particle, the speed may vary from time to time. In that case, finding the average speed becomes important to have an estimate of the rate at which the travel is completed. This is where we may use the concept of average speed. Average speed, a scalar quantity, is simply defined as the total distance covered by an object or particle over the elapsed time. You simply add all the distances covered by the particle or object. Even each of those distances was covered with different speed. Then divide the total distance by the elapsed time of travel. Please take note that getting the average speed does not simply mean that you have to add the values of different given speeds and divide the result by the total number of given speeds. Solving the average speed is not the same with computing the arithmetic mean. This formula is the right approach in getting the average speed. Aside from average speed, we also have average velocity, which is total displacement over time. Remember, displacement and average velocity are vector quantities, and that displacement is a change in position of the particle or object. This formula for average velocity is delta x all over delta t or displacement all over elapsed time. Notice the delta symbol, which means a change from initial to final condition. To visualize this definition, let's refer to the following figure. Take note that this red curve does not represent the travel path taken by the particle. Rather, it is the graph of the equation of motion of a particle giving us the information about the position of the particle at a certain time. In this graph, the vertical axis represents the position, while the horizontal axis represents the time taken. We are given here two points, which represents the initial and final condition. Notice that a straight line which intersects those points is drawn in order to get the average velocity within this time interval from t sub 1 to t sub 2 and with a change in position represented by delta x. Only for this encircled scenario, the slope of this line represents the average velocity. That slope is simply rise over run, or simply delta x all over delta t. Right now, you might be wondering that if, that if speed is also defined as the magnitude of velocity without a change in direction for rectilinear motion, then if given a particular scenario, such as in the figure, is the value of the magnitude of average velocity equal to the value of average speed? You may pause the video to think for a while. So the answer is not always. Take note that the magnitude of average velocity is not always equal to average speed. You have already observed from, from previous example that displacement a vector quantity and travel distance, a scalar quantity, are not always equal. The same applies for average velocity and average speed. Since based on their formulas, their numerators are in terms of, of displacement or total distance travel. Therefore, the magnitude of average velocity 
is not always equal to average speed. Now, how about finding the velocity of a particle or object at a specific time? To answer this question, let's tackle now instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity is the velocity of a particle at any given instant. If you can still remember from your differential calculus, this concept is similar to instantaneous rate of change in where you apply limits to get the slope at specific points in the curve and consequently you were introduced to the differentiation process, a mathematical technique that you can apply to a given equation of the curve, which will also allow you to get the slope at specific points on the curve. Recall in differential calculus that when given an equation of a curve, let's say for example this explicit function, the first derivative of the equation represents the equation for getting the value of the slope, which is the y prime at any point on the given curve. You just substitute any real value of x to get the slope at that point. Also, by first derivative, you will be able to draw all possible lines tangent to the given curve using any point and its corresponding slope that you can get from this equation. An example is this graph which shows the possible lines that only touch the curve on a specific point. Or in terms of instantaneous velocity, if we consider this graph as plotted from the equation of motion, the slope of this blue line represents a velocity at a particular instant. Now kindly look at the difference between average velocity and instantaneous velocity. It can be noticed that average velocity is much more general and requires the initial and final conditions. On the other hand, instantaneous velocity is very specific. Its concern is only about one point. Despite of their difference, instantaneous velocity is actually derived from average velocity. Using a similar approach that you have encountered from your differential calculus, we write first the formula of average velocity and then to define the needed tangent line, this dashed line, for specific point or instant, we set the limit of this equation as delta t or the time interval gets smaller and smaller to reach that specific point or in other words as delta t approaches zero. So this defines the instantaneous velocity. When you look at the graph, for example this one, the time interval is, a, is between zero and about 4.5 or 4.6. So to, to get the instantaneous velocity, for example for this point, with this dashed line that represents average velocity, you set the time interval to become smaller and smaller until it approaches zero so that this line will slowly move closer and closer to this point until you will be able to define the, the slope at this point that represents the instantaneous velocity. Again, from calculus, this equation simply means that instantaneous velocity or v is equal to the derivative of displacement with respect to time. Take note that if the problem mentions the word velocity only, it is a common practice to consider it as instantaneous velocity. Using our understanding now with average and instantaneous velocity, let's similarly define 
and understand the formulas for average and instantaneous acceleration. Average acceleration is the change in velocity divided by an elapsed time and is expressed as follows. Take note that same as with average velocity, average acceleration is also defined by two points or two conditions, the initial and final conditions. This, del this delta V means final velocity minus initial velocity. Then this delta T means final time minus initial time. Next concept is instantaneous acceleration, which is simply an acceleration at any given instant. To derive the formula for instantaneous acceleration, let's refer to this graph. Observe that the vertical axis is in terms of velocity rather than position, while the horizontal axis is still in terms of time. You can see here that the pink, green, and violet lines are all examples of average acceleration since these lines are defined by two points or by initial and final conditions. While the blue line is an example of instantaneous acceleration since it only intersects at one point of the curve. We can say that the pink, green, and violet lines can approach the blue tangent line by letting the time interval to become smaller and smaller. So by applying calculus again, we set the limit of the average acceleration as delta t approaches zero. In order to define the instantaneous acceleration as follows, which is also equal to, to the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Take note that if the problem mentions, mentions the word acceleration only, it is a common practice to consider it as instantaneous acceleration. Observe the similarity between the formulas for velocity and acceleration so that you can easily familiarize these formulas. Also, by investigating these formulas, you can find out that instantaneous acceleration is also equal to the second derivative of displacement with respect to time. So, since acceleration is derivative of velocity with respect to time, and that velocity is equal to derivative of displacement with respect to time, so second derivative of velocity of displacement is the another formula for instantaneous acceleration. Now, now that the formulas for speed, velocity, and acceleration were explained, let's proceed with the signs of acceleration. So for the signs need that we should consider for acceleration, Let's consider this figure. This figure shows the four possible cases of relating velocity and acceleration, which can occur in a rectilinear motion. In case A, it shows that the particle is moving faster because its velocity and acceleration are in the same direction. In case B, the particle is slowing down because its velocity and acceleration are not in the same direction. The same goes with case C. The particle is also slowing down because velocity and acceleration are not in the same direction. And lastly, case D is similar to case A. The particle is moving faster because its velocity and acceleration are in the same direction. To give you a concrete guideline, you may refer to this table. In here, the sign of speed 
represents whether it is speeding up, which is positive, or slowing down, which is negative. The third column represents the direction of velocity, while the last column represents the direction of acceleration. Take note, this last column does not represent the magnitude of acceleration, only the direction of acceleration. To use effectively this table, just use the rule of multiplication for integers. For example, if you are given that a particle is speeding up and moving in a negative direction, then what do you think is the direction of the acceleration? So based on the table, it belongs to case D. And the answer is negative acceleration. Notice that you can simply multiply the signs of the given that is positive for speed since it is speeding up times negative since it is moving in the negative direction. And the result is negative, which means the acceleration is negative. You can do this process whether you are asked about the direction of motion or whether the object is speeding up or slowing down. Just multiply the known signs in order to arrive to the appropriate sign of what is being asked. For example, if you are asked about the direction of motion, given that the speed is slowing down and that the acceleration is positive, so you just multiply the, the sign for the speed, which is negative, times positive, and then you get a negative direction. This means that the particle is moving in the negative direction. Also, if you are given with a negative acceleration and that the particle is moving in the positive, positive direction, to know whether it is slowing down or speeding up, you multiply the given and then you get a negative answer, which means that the particle is slowing down. With your understanding now about the signs of acceleration, let's ponder for a moment about the following question. If a particle has a negative acceleration, does it mean that it is decelerating? To answer this question, let's define deceleration first. Deceleration refers to an acceleration when the speed of the particle decreases, which means that the particle is slowing down. This follows that the answer to our previous question is, it is not always the case that when a particle decelerates, it should have negative acceleration. What is certain is that when the particle decelerates, it is indeed slowing down. Take note that Positive or negative acceleration is not only due to slowing down or speeding up of a particle. Rather, it is due to change in magnitude, direction, or both of the velocity. A particle can still be moving faster even with negative acceleration as we have observed from case D. Negative acceleration moving in a negative direction this means that the particle is speeding up. The negative sign could mean that it is moving faster and traveling in opposite direction, such as in case D. Do not forget that acceleration is a vector quantity described by both magnitude and direction. Now that we have covered the formulas and concepts behind speed, velocity, and acceleration, you may now start learning the kinematic equations in the next part of this lecture. That's it for now, class. Thank you and God bless.